Is this lecture 10? Yeah. 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 All right. So lecture 10. This is polarity. So polarity has to do with bonding. And before we talk about bonding, we need to talk about a new concept called electronegativity. Electronegativity. What is that? Electronegativity is an atom's affinity. Affinity is a fancy word. I like to think of it as an atom's want. So an atom's affinity for electrons. Or an atom's want for electrons. <laughs> So let's draw our little periodic table sketch like we've done before. Oh, I need to make a little space. Hold on. There we go. All right, so I am going to show you the trend for electronegativity. And let's look at fluorine, and let's look at francium. So fluorine. How many valence electrons does fluorine have? Seven. Seven. Yep, it's one away from octet. It has seven valence electrons electrons. Does it want an electron really bad? Yes. It does, because it only actually needs one more, and then it would have achieved octet. So we describe fluorine as something with high electronegativity. How about francium? How many valence electrons? does francium have? One. It has one. Good. It's in the alkali metals. It has one valence electron. Does it want more electrons? Well, I mean, if it did, it would no, need it seven more. So is there like a strong desire to gain more electrons? No. Not really. It doesn't really want them. In fact, not only does it not want them, it wants to give them away, which is called ionization. Um, but as far as electronegativity, that means your desire, your affinity to gain electrons. Yeah, Francium doesn't really want them. So we say it has a low electronegativity. So the trend, if you would, from left to right, stuff on the left is low, stuff on the right is high, and it is a spectrum. It increases in electronegativity as it goes from left to right or decreases from right to left. Because, how about oxygen right here to the left of fluorine? Does it want electrons? To the left of fluorine. To the left of fluorine. It, it's got oh. six valence electrons. Does it want electrons? Yes, it does. Does it want them as bad as fluorine? No, not quite as bad. It wants them, but not quite as bad. What about going up and down within a family? So I've talked to you about left and right, but what about up and down? So what about chlorine or bromine? So how many valence electrons does chlorine and bromine have? Seven. Seven. Right? They both or also have seven valence electrons. So all of them want electrons. But who wants them more? Chlorine, bromine. So who wants them as you go down a family? They all want one. Do they all have the same electronegativity? Or does one want one more than the other? Well, the answer is 
one wants more, more than the other, and it, this has something to do with size. Yeah, so size matters. The smaller you are, the, yeah, the size of your um, electron cloud, if it's smaller, then you have a stronger affinity for electrons. Why? Because your nucleus is more exposed. So fluorine only has nine electrons surrounding it grand total. So if you think about fluorine, it has one, maybe one electron cloud. So it really wants that one. Versus chlorine has two. And then bromine has three, right? So when we're thinking about Bohr's model of electron shells, valence electrons are on the outside. How much does an atom want an extra electron? Well, if it's kind of farther away, the attraction is not as strong. So the larger you are as an atom, the lower your electronegativity. So the trend here, it decreases as you go down a family. Because as you get larger, the attraction is just not as strong. Okay? So we're talking about electronegativity and we're talking about this affinity or desire to have electrons. And I, this is leading up to this idea of bonding and specifically covalent bonding. So when we talked about covalent bonding before, we said that that is between nonmetals and nonmetals. All the yellow ones right here on the right hand side of the periodic table. Do all of those kind of have a large electronegativity? Do they all want electrons over there? Yeah, I mean they have seven, six, five valence electrons. Most of the nonmetals actually want electrons. So when you have a covalent bond between two nonmetals, they have to share. But sometimes that sharing is not equal. So covalent bonds. are sharing, right, shared electrons between nonmetals and nonmetals. And we can further classify our covalent, covalents, sorry, it's not covalents, it's just covalent. A covalent bond shares electrons between nonmetals if they equally share, we call this non-polar. And this is equal sharing. If they unequally share, we call this polar. Unequal sharing. Well, okay, we've heard of the word polar because of the North Pole and the South Pole. And then we've heard of, um, like, bipolar disorder, right? If you've heard of somebody being diagnosed with bipolar disorder, often their, their moods or their behaviors are extreme. They're from one end to the other. And that's the same thing. We've got the North Pole and the South Pole. Or you often will look at a battery, and the positive and negative ends sometimes could be called poles. So... Or, oh, we're polar opposites. That means we're exactly, we're very opposite. So this word polar or pole is um, this idea of a difference. All right, so speaking of that, how do we determine if something is a nonpolar bond or a polar bond? It's by something called the difference in electronegativities. So difference in electronegativities. Difference in electronegativity. When I'm talking mathematically about difference, what do I mean? What's mathematically, what's the difference of something? Minus, Minus. yeah, subtraction. So if you're finding the difference, it is subtraction. And when you subtract and you're trying to find the difference, you take the absolute value. That's absolute value. So, for example, if I said, what's the time difference? 
between here and New York City? It's what? Here in New York City, what's the time difference? What? Three. Three hours, yeah. How about New York City and here? What's the time difference? Three hours. It's the same, right? The difference, it's three hours whether I'm in California or whether I'm in New York. It just happens to be later in New York than in California, but still the difference is three hours. What if I said, what is the distance between your house and Kennedy, and you said something like five miles? What if I switched it? Kennedy and your house, it's still five miles. So often in physics, we start to talk about distance and, and velocity and acceleration, and that has to do with something you're going to learn about next year called vectors. So vectors tell you direction, um, because if you subtracted two places, is there any such thing as like a negative distance? No. You can go to school or you can leave school. Those would be going two different directions. One's not positive, one's not negative. There's no negative distance. So physics, you're going to learn more about vectors. In chemistry, we're using absolute values to find the difference in something. So maybe you've never actually used absolute values for a reason. You're just, we're told, make it positive. And that's because, yeah, when you're looking at the difference between two things, if there's no such thing as like negative time. And in this case, one is more electronegative than the other. All I care about is that difference. All right, so differences in electronegativities is just that. It's subtraction of an assigned electronegativity electro -negativity value. So go ahead and turn to page 174 of your workbooks. Hopefully there, there's one laying around you. And this is an electronegativity chart that's similar to yours, although it has commas in it. Let's see if we can find a better one. No. Yeah, I don't know why this thing has commas. It's kind of weird. Yeah, 174 has this one. There we go. That one's not bad. So you notice that this is your periodic table, and you notice these don't have anything to do with the atomic number or the mass. In fact, if you notice, the range is anywhere from 4.0 up there with fluorine. And if you notice cesium and francium, francium is 0 0.7. So this is the electronegativity chart where scientists have assigned a number based on how badly you want an electron or not. All right, so keep your book open because I have to switch back to my notes. If you subtract two electronegativities, you take the difference of them, and the answer falls between 0, zero and 0 0.4, we assign that, we call it, not unpolar, I keep writing N, nonpolar, unpolar, it's nonpolar. So X is the difference in electronegativity. So what do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. Let's look at the bond between carbon and hydrogen. All right, so find out what carbon is. Open up your book, page 174. What is the electronegativity of carbon? 2.5. What is hydrogen? 2.1, are you guys seeing that? Yeah? And I subtract them, and I take the absolute value, that is 0 0.4. All right, that means the bond between carbon and hydrogen is in fact nonpolar. The electrons are shared pretty equally. Who wants the electrons more, carbon or hydrogen? Carbon, because it's 2.5 instead of 2.1. But it's such a subtle difference that it's almost no difference at all, and therefore it's shared equally. Now, if the difference falls between, it's greater than 0 0.4 to about 1.8, we call this polar. And then if it is greater than 1.8, we actually call that ionic. 
So let me give you an example of polar. How about carbon and oxygen? Natalie, what's oxygen? Do you see it on there? You're far away from me. Yell it out for us. Look on your book. What's oxygen's electronegativity? Three point five. And we already knew carbon was two point five, so we'll subtract them, take the absolute value that turns out to be one point zero. 1.0 actually falls into the range of, right here, this range, right? It falls in that range. So it's polar. If I were to take something like, oops, how about lithium and fluorine? What's lithium? I don't know. Who's got their book open there? Yeah, what's lithium? 1.0. What's chlorine? 3.0? Okay. I take the difference. That's 2.0. All right. That's an ionic bond. But I could have told you that anyways. Why? Because ionic bonds are between metals, lithium, and chlorine, non-metal. And remember, why is this? Chlorine is assigned 3.0. It really, really wants an electron super bad. So it's got a high electronegativity, and lithium has a low one, so it just gives it away. And that's the nature of ionic bonds. I'd like to point out that this is a spectrum. Sure, we call you nonpolar, polar, or ionic, but what if the difference in your electronegativity was, here, I'll write it in blue. What if you had a difference in electronegativity of 0 0.5 or 1.5? Which one is more polar? 1.5, yeah. And what does it mean to be polar? Well, it means that the element that wants the electrons more, the electrons hang out a little bit closer to that nucleus. So if I'm carbon and Alexa is oxygen, we're both nonmetals. Our electrons are being shared in this region between us. But who wants electrons more, me the carbon or Alexa the oxygen? Oxygen. So the electrons that are shared kind of get in a traffic jam closer to, to her. All right? So that's what unequal sharing is, is yes, we're sharing, but they like her more, or they hang out closer to her proton more. That's all. That becomes really important, which we're going to learn about the rest of this week, as far as a polar molecule or a nonpolar molecule, and how that plays a role for dissolving things and solubility of stuff. All right?